Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Bei Dai from the Cryptography and Re uh, Privacy Research Group. Uh, welcome you all here to Microsoft. I hope you have a good flight and uh, sleep well. And let's begin our uh, session today. The first one will be uh, Christine Lauter, our manager, and probably you all know her. Uh, she'll start with the opening talk. And uh, the whole day is really packed, so I hope you get uh, breakfast and you know enjoy the whole day. Thank you. Let's start with uh, the first session. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We're really delighted to be hosting this private AI workshop. Um, so I wanted to say, first of all, a big thank you to Wei Dai, who's organized this whole thing. So let's give Wei a round of applause. <laughs> And um, Janus uh, is in the back. Thank you for organizing all the logistics. Thank you so much, Janus. <laughs> um, so this uh, event is funded by Microsoft Outreach uh, to form connections with uh, it, all kinds of academic institutions. And we're very happy to bring all of you here to be part of, to join in the fun of private AI which is kind of a long-standing research project that we've had in my group. And we're hoping that you learn a lot and that it'll be a very hands-on experience and that you will end up taking the ideas and things that you uh, learn from this workshop into your research program in the future. It's also a um, very a not so subtle uh, goal of this workshop to kind of identify possible interns and collaborators for the future. So we really hope that you'll get a chance to talk to all the people in our team here that you're hearing speaking today and who will be helping you with the projects. So uh, when Wei um, gives his introduction, he's going to talk a little bit more about the structure of the workshop. But basically, what you should expect is over the next three days, you'll be working in teams of four and working on identifying um, applications of uh, these kinds of privacy technologies in AI and machine learning. Uh, so I wanted to kind of kick the workshop off with some high-level um, uh, information and description about kind of what we've done so far and what, what the problems are in this space. So I'll be talking about joint work that's been done with many members of my team, the cryptography research team, and with uh, Foundry 99, with uh, Srikanth uh, Kanapali's team, and Srikanth will be speaking next. So um, I'm going to speak for uh, roughly 35 minutes, and then uh, Srikanth is, is going to speak uh, for, for 20. So um, the, uh, the cryptography uh, research team has uh, covered a lot of different uh, projects over time. And more recently, we actually call ourselves cryptography and privacy uh, because of the need to uh, identify technologies that can help with, with privacy in this kind of fast changing era. So we, we've worked on a lot of different topics. So I myself am a mathematician by background. I did my PhD in mathematics almost 25 years ago now, and I uh, work on the mathematics of cryptography. So our team has worked over time on, for example, elliptic curve cryptography and uh, created the elliptic curve code that shipped in Windows and then all the products in our, in our company as of uh, going back to Windows Vista in 2005. I've also, our team worked a lot on pairing-based cryptography. Uh, introduced super singular isogeny based cryptography, which is a post quantum technology. A lot of uh, work on lattice based cryptography, which is the foundation for homomorphic encryption, which we'll be talking about here. So, we've worked on a lot of different uh, cryptography technologies over time. And more recently, uh, we've been kind of moving into the space of where crypto intersects with ML, machine learning, and, and AI. So, um, what I want to talk about uh, first is private AI. What do we mean by private AI? So um, AI is a kind of technology revolution. Artificial intelligence uses machine learning algorithms, which are mathematical algorithms, to um, uh, solve various uh, problems for society and people on a, even a day-to-day -day basis from things as, as silly as you know, walking around with your phone, using your location and getting a restaurant recommendation for restaurants nearby, 
to things as serious as um, uh, hospital, you know, emergency room admissions uh, decisions, whether a patient has, you know, they come presenting certain symptoms and whether they should be admitted to an emergency room. Uh, or, sorry, if they're in the emergency room, if they should be admitted to the hospital. So there's all kinds of um, decisions that are more and more going to be made with algorithms, ML algorithms and AI. And the problem that arises is that the, the privacy of the underlying information is at play. So for example, whether you are, if you're looking for um, location-based data and you're sharing your location with a service, then you do not necessarily know how that location data is going to be used in the future. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I got a little notification on my phone from an app that I didn't even know was installed, telling me they had collected my location data 13 times in the last hour or something like that. And so that's the kind of thing that we're facing is, is that as cloud services roll out, providing useful services with ML and AI, how can we protect our privacy in that context? So that's one slice of the picture. But when you dig into this, hopefully in your teams when you'll be thinking about this, there's a lot of different privacy problems uh, at play here. And when uh, I was going to just mention, I don't have a slide about this, but just a few weeks ago I was invited to the White House to a round table on uh, federal data sharing. So federal agencies that want to share data with each other. And well, what's the privacy problem there? Federal, data, uh, federal agencies have maybe collected data, maybe even from video surveillance. Surveillance could be um, less sensitive than that, could be, uh, or could be extremely sensitive data such as health data. And this type of uh, data they might want to share each, with each other to make some uh, good decisions or to, to protect the public in some way or another or to help um, uh, advance certain initiatives. But uh, how do you share data between these agencies without uh, compromising the privacy of the, of the people's data that's involved? So there's a lot of different ways you can slice the privacy problem. So I tend to think of um, it in terms of one particular tool that has really changed what we can do in this space. And when, so when we say private AI, we're referring to a collection of privacy technologies, but the foundational one that we're interested in getting you all involved with here in this workshop these few days is homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption is a, a fairly new mathematical tool where new, new means roughly 10 years old, slightly less than 10 years. It's from a mathematical point of view, you can just think of it as a commutative diagram. Uh, it means that uh, if you take data, let's say pieces of data A and B, and um, you operate on them, you compute on them, either you multiply them together or you add them together, um, the, uh, this computation commutes with uh, encry the encryption function. So if you, if you first encrypt the data and then compute on it, you'll get the same thing as if you first compute on it and then encrypt it. So anyone, any mathematician will think that this is a very natural explanation because this is just what homomorphic means. It's just encryption, which is homomorphic. The problem is, is that most people in the public don't know what homomorphic is, and they usually even have a hard time even pronouncing it. Um, so I like to give this explanation because not only it says what homomorphic encryption is, that basically encrypt, you can just, in one sentence, you can tell anyone what homomorphic encryption is. It is encryption that commutes with computation. That's, that's what it is. But what does it do for you? Why is it important? So if you um, look at this diagram, Diagram, what it means is, is that if you have some data and you want to do some data analytics or even some machine learning model applied to that data, some AI, um, you could do that yourself. You can do that locally. So if you have the models and you have the uh, wherewithal to implement some kind of uh, package to evaluate these models, you can do that locally. And that's always kind of the base case that you should compare against is that, um, you know, clients or enterprise customers or consumers can always choose to implement things locally versus outsourcing to the cloud. So this arrow, think of it as outsourcing to the cloud. So imagine if you now, instead of uh, 
doing your computation locally, you actually take your data and you upload it to the cloud. But you want to preserve the privacy of your data, so you upload it in encrypted form. So you encrypt it first. So now the cloud has your encrypted data. So now what can they do? Well, with homomorphic encryption, they could actually compute on this encrypted data without decrypting it. That's the whole point of outsourced computation and storage using homomorphic encryption. Is, is that you upload, uh, you encrypt it locally, you upload it to the cloud, you, then you can compute on it, and what you get out is a, some encrypted computation. Now the cloud doesn't, can't do anything with this encrypted computation. The cloud just knows that it did some computation and it has some encrypted results. And so what, they can, what you can do is have the cloud send back the uh, encrypted data to the encrypted output to the client and they can decrypt it locally. So that's the whole idea of homomorphic encryption. And um, so like I said, it's about uh, 10 years old. In 2009, the first uh, solution was proposed by Craig Gentry at IBM, but it was considered wildly impractical. And large, largely because of, um, well, in the next two years, let's say, between 2009 and 2011, the schemes evolved very quickly, but also the manner for handling data. So in 2011, at Microsoft Research and our team, we had several surprise breakthroughs. One was um, the first homomorphic encryption scheme, which was based on RLWE, which is the ring learning with errors problem. I won't have much time to talk about that here in this talk, but I'd be happy to talk with any of you more about the mathematics behind this uh, during the workshop. Um, the second breakthrough was really a different approach to uh, practical encoding of data, which led to about four orders of magnitude speed up in the computations. So um, instead of encrypting bit by bit, which allows you to do um, both error, what's called error growth management and plain text growth management, instead of encrypting bit by bit, we enc encrypt large flo floating point numbers directly into ciphertext, which allows you to do computation um, in a much, much simpler way. It squashes all the circuits so that you don't need really, really deep circuits to evaluate a single multiplication. So that, uh, that's a um, paper called How uh, Can Homomorphic Encryption Be Practical with uh, Vinod Vaikatanathan and Michael Lerig, and we um, introduced this kind of new approach to encoding data. And then the, the next real breakthrough in this area, when I showed you the two globes at the beginning, crypto and ML together, represented a kind of a turn where we really, in our, in our group, we really started focusing on the intersection between machine learning and cryptography in roughly 2015. So four years ago, in 2016, CryptoNets was published in ICML, which is a major machine learning conference, and CryptoNets was the first paper to show that you could actually evaluate deep neural nets on homomorphically encrypted data. So this is the thing that was really surprising. People in the theoretical community thought that homomorphic encryption was so impractical because you encrypt data bit by bit, you have extremely deep circuits to do even the simplest possible computation, and it made it look like absolutely ridiculous to even do, to do the simplest thing. Whereas CryptoNets showed that um, you could even evaluate deep neural nets on homomorphically encrypted data. So that kind of changed uh, the way people uh, th thought about things. Let me just say a word about the mathematics behind this. Um, the lattice-based cryptography that we use for homomorphic encryption, the key thing to remember if you're not a mathematician and you don't care about the mathematics, is, is that it's currently considered post-quantum secure. So that means we do not know um, polynomial time quantum algorithms for breaking this type of encryption, which is a major feature because in the industry we will soon be moving to post-quantum solutions for encryption um, as more and more uh, money and, and efforts being put into developing quantum computers at scale. And there's currently a five-year post-quantum cryptography computation going on. It's an international uh, com competition um, being hosted by NIST, National Institutes of Standards and Technologies. And lattice-based cryptography is one of the um, solutions that's being proposed for standardization by NIST. So the hard underlying problem 
problem of lattice-based cryptography is basically being able to find uh, either the shortest vector in a lattice or an approximate shortest vector. And so currently, the best known attacks on these systems take exponential time, both uh, classically and on a quantum computer. So that's kind of a feature of these systems. So as I said, I won't have a lot of time to talk about the mathematics, but you can think of a lattice as just being a discrete linear subspace of continuous space. So think of it, this is just two dimensions, but think of it as being um, dots, a linear space of, of dots within Euclidean space that is specified by some set of basis vectors. So this is just two-dimensional picture here. You have two vectors. Think of this uh, point right here as being the origin. And these, um, if you think of it in n dimensions, so for homomorphic encryption, typically you should think of n, the dimension of the lattice, being a minimum of 1,000, so uh, uh, roughly 10 bits. We have, uh, in our SEAL library, we have um, n is always a power of 2. So 1024 is usually the smallest dimensional lattice that you'll ever be working with. But if you're using SEAL this week, you may very well have applications where you need to take n to be um, a higher power of 2, such as um, you know, 2048 or um, 4,000, like 4,096, so, uh, or even, even higher. And so think of a, a very large dimensional lattice, not just a two-dimensional lattice. And the hard problem is if you have um, a bad basis. So here I had given you what's kind of a good basis. Good because the vectors are short and they're relatively orthogonal to each other. This is supposed to be slightly worse because they're more skewed. They're, the angle is uh, closer to each other and the, um, the vectors are longer. But imagine vectors who, which have endpoints over in you know, New York or something like that. So really long vectors. Now in two dimensions, it's easy to take um, a bad basis and turn it into a good basis. You simply do this, what's called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. You project one vector onto the other and then you subtract. So it's a very efficient way to reduce down, back down to a, a good basis, a small basis. But in high dimensions, what happens if you try that same idea pairwise, you'll get what's called the LLL algorithm, essentially. And it works very well. You can also uh, do it in polynomial time, but the approximation you get to the shortest vector is exponentially bad. So there you have a good approximation algorithm in terms of running time, but it's bad in terms of the quality of the approximation. If you try to force the algorithm to have really good approximation factor, then you end up with exponential time algorithms. So that's what underlies the security of these systems. And the encryption, you'll see more details in other talks later today, but the encryption is basically um, adding noise to a secret inner product in this vector space. So you'll have um, the person who wants to encrypt has some, uh, some secret, which can be written as a vector in this space. And then they'll have some noise, which is generated according to some distribution. The noise is smaller than the uh, random, random distribution. It's Gaussian with some small standard deviation. And what happens is that if you want to encrypt, you basically take your message and you blind it with a secret inner product plus some noise. That's the idea behind encryption here. And if you have the secret, it's easy to decrypt because it uses some randomness that comes with the ciphertext. You uh, recreate the secret inner product by taking the inner product of the randomness with your secret, and then you subtract that off. And now what you have is a message that just has a little bit of noise that can be rounded out of it. But if you don't have the secret, it's very hard to uh, essentially find out what was that closest vector to the, the target vector that you received. So that's why, so that's kind of an explanation of why the hardness, the security of in encryption using these systems really depends on the hardness of these underlying closest vector problems or shortest vector problems. So the best attacks that we know on these systems that work if you choose your parameters badly, though you can run polynomial t uh, time attacks on these things if your parameters are chosen badly. They basically find the closest vector using like Bye-bye's uh, algorithm. 
So I don't have a lot of time to talk about the error, error growth. This has to do with how you set your parameters because as you take ciphertexts and you want to operate on them, that means you want to add them together and multiply them, um, the error that you've added in will grow. And that's what this um, picture kind of demonstrates is, is that when you add vectors together that have a little bit of error, the red is the error here. The error grows a little bit more, but when you multiply them together, the error grows even more. And what happens is, is that when your error growth is too much and you go to kind of decode this vector, you will end up decrypting to the wrong lattice point, as you can see. So that's kind of should give you an intuitive idea of why the error controlling the error growth is one of the key things you have to do for setting parameters and uh, for correctness and, and security. Um, so you don't have to, uh, I, we have a, I just wanted to say one thing about the audience here. So we're so pleased to have you all. There were about 90 applicants and 30 people admitted. So it was quite competitive, but your backgrounds are very, very different, which is why I'm trying to cover a lot of aspects here. You don't necessarily need to work on the mathematics of homomorphic encryption in this workshop because we're going to get, try to get you working with SEAL, with the underlying um, encryption library. And a lot of the parameter selection can be done automatically or has been done for you depending on how it's configured. So these questions about error growth, you do not necessarily need to, to think about today. But if, on the other hand, if you're interested in the mathematics behind it, then please come and talk to me and others in our group uh, over the course of the workshop. So I wanted to give you an idea of all of the really kind of exciting applications that my team has worked on over the last eight years and others in the industry and in our, in our um, kind of partners and collaborators. Um, as, as it says here, uh, all of the work that we did basically from 2011 to 2014 was done in collaboration with machine learning researchers, bioinformatics experts, even finance experts. And that's one of the really exciting things for me about starting to work on this technology is, is that I felt highly motivated. I felt that working on privacy was a, is a social good. So actually, straight out, my main goal uh, professionally in life right now is to get homomorphic encryption widely adopted because I believe in it as a means to protect privacy for society. And I believe that in the future, we could see a future where much or all of uh, private information is actually encrypted at the source and handled in the cloud only in encrypted form. So that's the vision that I'm going for. I'm not giving up until I get there. But there's a lot of work to do because there's um, so much that we want to do with data and homomorphic encryption does add overhead to the computation. And so there's always going to be this resistance to why should we add a lot of basically cost in terms of time and money to what we want to do in these cloud services by having everything in encrypted form. So um, just very briefly, uh, using this kind of practical homomorphic encryption approach that we introduced in 2011, we're able to um, come up with um, algorithms for doing, I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff, a lot of genomic computation. So this was one of the first things that we really demonstrated is, is that you could do genomic computation on encrypt, encrypted genomes uh, at scale. And uh, so including statistical computation and predictive analysis. So these kinds of, um, these are typical statistical uh, tests that uh, genomics and bioinformatics researchers would run. This actually led into the IDASH uh, competition. The first homomorphic encryption competition for IDASH um, was uh, the tasks were related to um, analyzing genomes, uh, doing statistical chi-squared test, Hamming distance, and uh, edit distance. Um, and so IDASH, if you look it up, you'll find it's a secure genome analysis competition. Um, it might be interesting for you guys to think about in the context of your projects for this week, uh, what is the IDASH thing. So um, these are kind of old performance numbers which showed already five years ago extremely um, uh, efficient computation, 0.3 seconds for evaluating a model of whether, predicting whether you're likely to have a heart attack. This was something that was run um, by a major pharmaceutical company 
on a million records from a Chinese hospital to demonstrate the timing. This was about four years ago. So this should give you an idea that this, this technology was already pretty practical a while back. So now kind of zooming forward to today, what we've been working on very um, hard in our team and in collaboration with Foundry 99 with Srikant's team is bringing this uh, technology into um, the co commercial use. And so the first thing that we did was to release a very well engineered um, homomorphic encryption library called SEAL. So you should all have SEAL now on your laptops. Hopefully you'll be using it throughout the day and throughout the workshop. It was publicly released in 2015 for research use and then last year, uh, about a year ago, um, November 2018, it was released open source. So it can now be used uh, you know, commercially by any company in the world and we have been hearing from around the world different companies that are potentially using this um, to uh, protect privacy in various ways. So a few of the things that we've heard about are the release of, for example, Py, Py Seal, like a Python wrapper for Seal. Um, Dropout Labs has created encrypted TensorFlow built on Seal. Lots and lots of other announcements that we see um, month to month of how Seal is now being used and incorporated. So it should give you an idea that we're really at the point that this technology should be usable. The library is built to be used by general developers and our team has worked very hard to create materials, tutorials even, for developers who want to build applications on top of SEAL. And so that's also what we're trying to encourage you, all of you to think about uh, doing. Um, we've also been involved in a, a major standardization effort worldwide, uh, which I won't say much more about, but if you're interested, please come to our standardization workshops. Um, the, uh, I guess it'll be the fifth one will be coming up in the spring. Um, this is the third one from Toronto. Um, so, and then this is just a graph I like to show that explains kind of the progress of homomorphic encryption over time. So many people, including theoretical cryptographers, still think that homomorphic encryption is in this range where it was about 10 years ago. This literally uh, represents 13 orders of magnitude overhead. That's like a computation that would have taken you one second on unencrypted data takes you 10 to the 13 seconds on encrypted data. So that's why people think homomorphic encryption is so impractical. And with our practical encoding techniques, uh, we're really able to bring this down, like I said, roughly four orders of magnitude initially in uh, the initial paper in 2011 with our practical encoding techniques and now all kinds of, of uh, implementation, algorithmic and scheme improvements and uh, new ways of doing approximate computation, which you'll hear about from Young Su today, um, have brought us down to the point where we're roughly four orders of magnitude, three to four orders of magnitude. So that means something that takes you a second would take you in the matter of a thousand, thousands of seconds, but if it took you microseconds, now it takes you milliseconds. And so there's a lot of computation you can do that falls in that category. So these are some kind of raw performance numbers, but since I'm a little bit short on time, I will kind of skip over this. We can, I'd be happy to answer questions uh, on the performance numbers, but here, for example, is a typical lattice dimension you might use, like 4,000 or 8,000. And here you can see that amortized uh, uh, multiplication of ciphertext is like a quarter of a microsecond. So you're really fairly practical with this technology today using SEAL. Um, so what we've done over time is to focus on all different types of applications beyond genomics um, in health, in finance, and, and other areas, and even manufacturing. And um, one, the main um, uh, kind of scenario that we've thought about is private storage and computation. Um, some uh, examples of kind of data sharing as well, where multiple parties want to interact on the data. Um, and the private storage and computation has been largely focused on prediction services and uh, private training and things like private set intersection. So I'm going to kind of zoom forward to the, um, so these are some of the tasks from the IDASH competitions. As I said, you could look those up. 
if you're interested in applications in uh, genomic computation, secure genome analysis. Um, uh, these are all the libraries that we know of worldwide for homomorphic encryption that are publicly available. You can find this on the homomorphic encryption standardization webpage. Um, uh, we have, th th these are like all the different papers that have built on crypto nets recently. We're probably missing the most recent ones since this slide is like from August. So this, this area is moving fast. Um, teams working on improving, uh, being able to do uh, machine learning on encrypted data of different kinds. Um, and so just to give you an idea of the range of applications that we've worked on in our team and show you the demos, because you're going to be looking at coming up with your own applications in your team. So uh, way back when, uh, the, I skipped over this slide, but I showed this uh, heart attack risk prediction at the AAAS meeting in Chicago in 2015. So doing live kind of uh, using my own personal health data, putting it into my laptop, sending it up to the cl cloud, having the cloud do an encrypted prediction of my heart attack risk and sending it back locally and decrypting it. And that even at that time was done in less than a second. So crypto nets I told you about was a demo that I used to show. It showed being able to do handwriting recognition on encrypted data. So uh, a handwritten image is uh, expressed in terms of its pic pixels and all the pixels are encrypted. And we're able to do the um, neural net prediction at that time in about 80 seconds. It's now several orders of magnitude less than that with improvements that have come, come through the pipeline. Uh, we had another demo where we showed predicting um, the flowering time uh, uh, using the genome of a flower. So encrypt the genome of a flower. It's a flower just because it's easier to get access to flower's genome than it is to use a person's genome. And showing a uh, flowering time prediction from 200,000 SNPs of a, of a flower. Uh, and then pneumonia mortality risk was uh, very interesting because it was um, using intelligible models, which are easy to understand what the model was doing. It's not as opaque as like deep learning models where you don't really know what the model was doing inside. So it's hard to tell whether what it, it, the answer it gave you was reasonable. So more recently with Srikant's team, uh, we had a demo showing Twitter sentiment analysis. Also, image classification, cat, uh, classifying images as cats and dogs. And so all of these are kind of examples of outsourced computation, where the data was encrypted, sent up to the cloud, the computation was done, and the result was sent back. And um, hopefully in this workshop, you'll be thinking about even more kind of different types of applications. So the most recent demos, uh, these are the ones I'm just going to show you very quickly right now, Azure Run and Chest X-ray Diagnostics and Secure Weather Prediction um, are, okay, so the uh, Azure Run is basically creating an encrypted um, version of a fitness app. So if you have a, a fitness tracker and you upload, um, if you have a, a, a cloud service that uploads your, your encrypted, or sorry, if you just have something on your wrist like this today, it's not going to be uploading encrypted data. It's just uploading your location, so GPS data, but also um, it could have things like your heart rate, an uh, accelerometer, gyroscope, things like that. So it's uploading all kinds of data to the cloud and then giving you analytics. So that's what you have today. This is a demo of an encrypted version of this, which is actually released. It's called Azure Run. And as you can see, it's on purpose that you can't read all of this stuff. This is supposed to be the encrypted version of the data. All the data was just uploaded to the cloud in encrypted form from, from the run that you just took. And then it can do a prediction, for example, of how intense was your workout. And, and this is a video of the demo, but the, de the um, computation runs in the cloud. And as you can see, it, was, uh, it returned an encrypted answer. Um, as to the, uh, the intensity of your workout, and it was decrypted locally. So this is much like the heart attack risk uh, prediction, but it's uh, using different models. Now here, chest x-rays um, are something where, let's see if I can get this to start. A, a doctor might want to take an image and upload an image to the cloud, and here it's an image of a chest x-ray. 
and have that analyzed, how likely are you to have various different types of disease? And that, that's what's happening now in the cloud. Um, this encrypted image is being analyzed, and what's being sent back to the client then is going to be an encrypted, um, uh, it's already done, an encrypted per, um, probability that is decrypted locally that you have something like effusion, something like 91% likelihood, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a way that a doctor could use a kind of a private cloud service where they could upload encrypted versions of patients' records and have them analyzed in the cloud on, in, on a, in encrypted form and then have the results be sent back to the doctor. So this is a kind of a medical example. And then finally, I have the secure weather prediction, which um, is uh, supposed to allow you to protect your location privacy. So if you're here in Redmond and you put that zip code in, 98052, then uh, this secure weather service, the secure weather service would uh, give you the um, prediction of, sorry, let me do it. It was so fast it went by already. Let me do it again. So it, after the zip code was uh, typed in, the Secure Weather Service will get an encrypted version of that, and it will return the weather without knowing what your zip code was when you made the query. So, um, and here we are. We're at the Private AI Boot Camp. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you'll enjoy the workshop. And I'm going to turn it over to Srikanth.